grace and mercy and peace to you from God our Father, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> this summer I got a new car, a Nissan. Well, not a new, new car. I bought a used car from Hertz, but it only had 10,000 miles on it, so I call that new. <clears throat> Why did I get a car now? Because Nick Turturro said to. Now, who's Nick Turturro? Well, he's a good friend and is a member of this congregation who runs the Goodyear franchise down on Middle Country, right beside McDonald's. There's a Goodyear franchise there, garage. Uh, the, the whole time I've been pastor of St. James Lutheran, I have driven a black Mazda minivan. When I came here 10 years ago, I'd already been driving that van for 10 years in Queens. And ever since coming here, Nick Turturro and his guys at Goodyear have kept my old van running great. They have, there have been times, it has not always been easy, there have been times when it had big problems, you can imagine. But Nick would say to me, just leave it with me, Pastor Neil. And I did, and he always fixed it. And sometimes it took quite a lot of trouble to do that. But even if it was a big repair, costing you know plenty of shekels, I never mind it at all, because I know that Nick is honest, he's doing a great job, and I know he's actually trying to keep the price down. And that's why I was driving a 20-year-old beaten-up minivan. Well, then why did I get a new vehicle? Because <laughs> I, I took the van to Nick uh, for an inspection, you know, to get the inspection sticker. And he said to me, Pastor Neil, I'm going to put the sticker on your windshield. But you've got to promise me that you are going to get a new vehicle. There are expensive things that I can see are going to go soon on this van. Some of them have got to do with the brakes. And they don't make parts for this anymore, Nick said. I've, I've searched online even, and I cannot find those parts. So I'm going to give you this sticker now. But you and Carol have to go get a new vehicle. And promise me that that new grandbaby of yours is never going to go in this van. When I came home and told Carol the line about the grandbaby, she was hunting online for a new car that evening. But I cannot recommend this Goodyear garage too highly. It, just over here on Middle Country. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful how they've kept me and my family rolling and safe, and they've done it professionally and honestly. Okay. All right, so, so why am I bringing this up and spending five minutes of your life talking about Goodyear? Because I'm really pleased and even excited about how they take care of me. I want you to know the difference they've made in my life. And, and I've only told you part of it. They're, they're awesome over there. On a much grander scale, the task of telling others about what has made such a difference to our lives is a task that Jesus invites all of us to do. A life where we tell other people what difference Jesus has made to our lives. Because there are a lot of people just slogging along. Thousands of people right around here, thousands, do not know that there's a better way that involves having a life with the Lord. Me giving a recommendation for a garage is an illustration of what Jesus calls us to do. Open our mouths and give a recommendation to others to check him out. Now, dear confirmands, you're all scattered around this year because of COVID-19, but dear confirmands, today you're going to stand up in this church and give testimony to your faith in God. But what is the Christ that you believe in leading you to do after this day, after your confirmation? This, to keep opening your mouth and give a recommendation to your friends to check out your Savior. We've got opportunities to serve and to show people the love of Christ, and we also have opportunities to speak the words of God, 
Both of them are important and necessary. However, we tend to struggle far more with being God's mouthpiece and giving a clear recommendation about Jesus than we do with being God's hands and feet and serving. I know, I know many hope that speaking about Jesus is a job that should be done by professionals, you know, by pastors. But I'm afraid that idea is absolutely disastrous. It's, it's, it's a wrong idea. Um, and it's just not in the Bible. Uh, it should not be left to the professionals, um, like the pastors, okay? It's just not the case. In the, in the Bible, Jesus said, follow me, and I will send you to fish for people. Other translations say, I will make you fishers of men. Nothing wrong with fishing for fish, by the way. But Jesus says, I want you to fish for people. If you listen to what I say and do what I ask you to do, Jesus says, you're going you're gonna to catch people. How? How? Well, kind of like recommending a garage. You know how to do that. Only you're going to recommend Jesus to other people and what he's done and what he will do for them. You've been blessed, recommend that they check it out too. That's it. Jesus sends us with the purpose of making him known. In John chapter 20, he said, as the Father has sent me, even so, I'm sending you. In 2 Corinthians, the reading today, St. Paul wrote, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. However, as I said earlier, people find this hard and often not inclined to do it. They, they don't want to speak up. What could make them change their mind? What could motivate them to go and say something? In verse 14 of our reading from 2 Corinthians 5, Paul wrote of our motivation. He said, the love of Christ compels us. Notice he did not say, the love of Christ is an inspiring example for us. Now, to be sure, Jesus is inspiring, but his example alone will not change our hearts. The love of Christ is not something out there, standing as a goal for me to try and imitate. No, Paul says the love of Christ has literally come into me. It's made a change in my nature and my heart motivation. It's changed me inside. Christ's love has come into me, and now, from within, it's pushing me out. It compels me to open my mouth and tell others about this Christ and his love. Do you know what I'm talking about? Do you have a love inside of you that does not come from you? It doesn't come from you. It, it comes from God. But now it is inside of you, and it controls you, and it compels you like this. This is the purpose. This is the power for your life. That love, not, not mere human desire, but the love of God would come into your soul, and you'd be born again by it. The upwelling of it, swelling and sweeping, sweeping you along like a river compelling you to get going with God's love to others. Even though you may, by nature, be shy or fearful. But this love from God goes over all that. It goes over like, like, like water going over the top of a dam. It's a flood so that you feel like you just must be involved in letting others know about God's love in Christ. Is there a compelling love like that in Martin Luther did not have it in him. Not when he was young, not when he was a college student, not even when he was a monk. Why not? He did not understand the gospel, the good news, and not understanding it, of course, he was not able to believe it. What was Martin Luther clear on as a young man? 
that he had broken God's laws. Clear on that. But that's not the gospel. It's an important truth, a very important truth to start with. And I wonder, are you clear on God's law? Well, let's get clear on it now. God has commandments. One of them says, you shall not steal. Have you ever stolen anything? Like anything, ever? Yes? Well, what do you call someone who steals? A thief. Have you ever taken God's name in vain? That's another one of his commandments. Have you broken it? Texted OMG. Or said, oh my God, etc. That's very serious. And how insulting to God that you may regard it as a joke. You are publicly dishonoring the God of the universe and misusing his name as a vain thing. It's called blasphemy. If you've done it, then you are a blasphemer. <clears throat> Have you ever looked at another person with lust, a live person or a pornographic image? I'm not saying that I'm better or less guilty than you. I'm not saying that. But I am letting you know that Jesus said that if you've done this, it makes you an adulterer, sexually immoral in your heart. Have you ever been angry at someone so that you called them an idiot or worse? That anger in your heart is violence. Jesus said it's murder in there. You are a heart murderer, he said. So that was just four commandments, four out of ten. They indicate that you're a thief, blasphemer, heart adulterer, and heart murderer. If on Judgment Day, God judges you by his Ten Commandments, will you go to heaven or hell? Hell! Does that concern you? It concerned Martin Luther. Not only that, but he found that as he thought about the God who judged him guilty, he didn't like him and didn't want to be close to him or praise him. By becoming a monk, Luther thought maybe he could get God to like him and not judge him. But nothing Luther did could get rid of his sin. He was a thief, blasphemer, heart adulterer, heart murderer, and more. And so are you. So am I. In fact, when Luther was a monk, behind all the you know, crazy monk haircut and all that. He was mad at God. He, he pushed those feelings down because he didn't want to be struck by lightning. If you know his story, he didn't want to be struck again by lightning or anything. But he was not happy. He was estranged from God. He was alien in his heart. He was alienated from God. He could not love or feel love from a God who is criticizing and condemning him. Even though it was perfectly true that he was a sinner and deserved it. And then one day, while studying the Bible, he become, they made him the new professor, well, the, the professor of the Bible at a brand new university in Wittenberg. And he's studying the Bible. And one day, doing that, for the first time, Martin Luther understood not just the law of God, but the gospel of Jesus Christ. That, as St. Paul put it in our reading today, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's sins against them. Now, normally, if two people are alienated to change, to reconcile, they bring in a third party, perhaps a counselor. Same if there is a dispute in industry. A mediator will be summoned to bring the two estranged sides together. But this here says that not a third party, but God himself, so aggrieved by our sins, nonetheless in love, he provided a mediator. He provided a reconciler. Who? God become man. Jesus Christ. And God's reconciliation with the world happens on the cross. There, Jesus Christ bears for man and as man the sin of man. All of mankind. One died for all. One experienced devastating alienation on behalf of all others. Remember Jesus' words in his darkest moment on the cross? 
My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? One, Jesus endured forsakenness, ultimate estrangement for all mankind. So complete was the identification of the sinless Christ with the sin of the sinner, including its dire guilt and dread consequence of separation from God, that St. Paul could write profoundly, God made him to be sin for us. God, Jesus, on the cross, takes it all and exhausts the wrath of God against sin. Motivated. Motivated by what? Surpassing love. Love for you. Love for all people. God is not mad and threatening toward you. Even though you've sinned, he is reconciled to you. He is all love and embrace and desire to be with you, close to you, in you, with love. When Martin Luther suddenly understood what God's word was saying and that it was for him, he said he felt as though the gates of heaven had opened to him and he'd gone through them into the love and the light of God. God's love certainly came into him and it compelled him, compelled him to let his church and his town and all Germany and the world know that God, because of Christ, was already reconciled to them all. The message is it wasn't St. Paul's day, it was in Luther's day, it still is in our day. God is reconciled to you. Now, won't you be reconciled to him? Our response to God's reconciling love, he's taking a step, I'm reconciled to you. Our response to him, when he takes that step to us, it makes all the difference. Let, let me show you, if I can, how reconciliation works. Carol and I were already married when I went to seminary. That's college for pastors. One winter, it was like snowy, winter afternoon, I was at the school and Carol was about a mile away in our apartment. She told me to be home by 5.30. Certainly, dear. So there I was, reading in the SEM library, which I always enjoyed very much. And then I took a break and I was playing ping pong with John Nunes, who, by the way, is now president of Concordia College, New York. And I look at my watch, probably after defeating John, anyway. <laughs> and I look at my watch, and it's 25 past five. Gulp. There is no way I'm gonna make it home through the snow by 5.30. And this is before cell phones, obviously. I can't text Carol or anything. So I've got my boots on, and I am humping it through the snow. It's well past 5.30. And I'm imagining Carol with dinner, now drying out in the oven, looking at the clock, impatient and mad that I'm late and getting madder. At 10 to 6, I'm going up the stairs in our building, and I'm thinking, she... She doesn't understand the pressure I'm under as a student, how I have to do so much reading in the library. It's work. And sometimes you need a break, like playing ping pong. And, and ping pong games take time. She's going to be mad. But if she says this to me, I'm going to come back and say that to her, etc. Just imagining Carol being mad at me is making me mad at her. In, in my heart, I'm alienated from her. This, by the way, is how Luther felt about God and how everybody does until they hear and believe the gospel. What happened on that snowy day? So I top of the stairs and I go through our apartment door and as I go through that door, I am locked and loaded for a fight. And Carol says, sweetheart, you're home. She gives me a kiss, brushing the snow off me. She says, poor thing, your feet must be frozen. Sit down and warm up, and let's have a glass of wine before dinner, which, by the way, smelled delicious. She wasn't mad at me, not at all. She was loving. When I realized that, 
Whatever anger I had, it just drained. It drained out of me completely away. I didn't feel anger. I didn't feel alienated. Nothing like that. I felt, I felt loving toward her. We were not estranged. But together. That's what you and the whole world needs to know about God. He's not mad. He's totally he reconciled to you. Such warm, loving things toward you. Loving, embracing, welcoming of you. All the issues you created by your sins. God didn't say, oh, they don't matter. But he said, I've dealt with them, is what he says. I've dealt with them for you. In Christ's cross. In love. He's totally reconciled to you. Now, drop your heart feelings and be reconciled to him. Take into your heart the God who reaches to you with such love. And when you do, how will you know you do? What will be the sign that that happened? Christ's love will come into your soul and melt you. Something's going to melt you. It will warm you. It will change you. It will compel you. You want to see an example of the reconciling love of God compelling people? Then look no further than the shepherds of Bethlehem. You all wondered why we had the Christmas reading. Here's why. Look at these shepherds. Normally, they felt like God was against them. Don't matter how they felt like God was angry with them. Especially because that's what other people told them. Okay? Because shepherds always had to be out there in the fields of the sheep, like 24-7, there were many, many Jewish religious observances they could not <clears throat> do. And the common opinion was that shepherds made God mad. So they felt very alienated from God. And then one night, the time came for God the Reconciler to be born. And his name is Jesus. A spokesman from God called an angel came and told those shepherds not more of God's law, but the gospel, the good news for you, for you guys is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Those shepherds hurried to the manger side, and they not only saw with their eyes, but received into their hearts the loving reconciliation of God toward them. Something from heaven was born in them. What did they do next? Luke 2.17 says, When they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. What did they do? They opened their mouths and told the good thing that God had done as they understood it and as they experienced it. Just like you might tell somebody about a mechanic who'd been good to you, except the goodness of God is so much more important. And people listen. You know they do. When people who are like professional speakers, me, talk, it's like blah, 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 he's paid me. When shepherds say something, people listen, no matter how artlessly they say it. When you speak, you're going to be listened to. You do not have to be eloquent at all. You don't have to. People say, oh, I, I need to understand so much about the Bible before I would ever dare say something. No. You don't under, have to understand everything about the Bible. How much do you think I understand about cars and how to repair them? Not much. And yet I was able to give you a recommendation about Nick Tortoro, and I bet some of you are here are thinking, I should go to Goodyear. Likewise, we are able to give a recommendation about Jesus as we understand him and experience him. No matter how little we've, we actually understand, people are going to listen. When you speak up, God will use your simple testimony to have a big impact on And there's a plan. Now, actually, for those of you who are keeping a stopwatch on my sermon, the sermon ends here, okay? <laughs> I want that recorded. The rest of this is like announcements, okay? It doesn't count as part of a sermon.
because there's a plan. Here's the plan. We're working on a plan for two months from now. I'm talking about Christmas Eve, or actually the night before Christmas Eve, December 23rd. On the 24th, we will have our traditional Christmas services in the evening here in the sanctuary. But what we cannot do this year because of COVID-19 is put two or 300 people a couple of times down in the parish hall for our family Christmas services. So instead, on the 23rd, we're gonna have all our family stuff outside. We're going outside the building. Jesus is born outside, we're good with going outside. What we're going to have is a Christmas walk around. Many of you have seen the Good Friday walk around. That's kind of like that. As people are taken around the church in small groups of maybe 20, they'll, what are they going to see? They're going to see Gabriel appear to Mary. They'll see the wise men with life-size wooden camels. In fact, somebody here this morning is already working on these giant camels, okay? Uh, and we're going to hang a big star way up high on the church, okay? Um, uh, moving further on, they'll see the shepherds around a campfire, and angels will appear, going around, the, kind of around the build, around the block, or over where the garage is. They get to the garage, they're going to find a stable in that humble garage with Joseph and Mary and the baby lying in a manger. And maybe we'll have real sheep. We're trying to get them. <laughs> and by candlelight, right there, They'll sing Silent Night. Getting at last to the front stairs of the church, a band will lead them in singing Joy to the World. We'll have a prayer. We'll give them a little book. You get the idea. But here's the big idea. That you and I should invite our neighbors to come. Come and see. I'm looking for church members to put a sign on their lawn this December, like the election signs you see around town right now. Except this one will say, come, on, come to the Christmas walk around at St. James Lutheran Church. These signs will look nice. And in December, I would like people to walk around their block or down their street and pray for every house and every family. Oh, may good news come to this house, okay? And everyone who puts up a sign will be asked to deliver 50 invite postcards to the mailboxes of their neighbors. 50 at the beginning of December, and 50 again to those same houses in the middle of December. And you can see a photocopy of what the postcard looks like in the bulletin. Look, it's black and white in the bulletin. We've got these things in color. Thank you, Christy, for designing these. We handed out 200 of them yesterday at uh, Trunk or Treat. Listen, God is he's reconciled to every single person, thousands of every person in our community. But tragically, so many thousands do not know. And so they're not reconciled in their hearts to him. Let us pray earnestly for that to change. Let's pray for a thousand people to come to St. James Lutheran on December 23rd between 4.30 and 8.30 and see and hear the good news. I am praying that the love of Christ will compel us all, like the shepherds, to go, to go and actively participate in God's mission at Christmas. And together, we will be God's ambassadors as though God were making his appeal through us. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, guard your hearts minds in Christ Jesus for life everlasting. Amen.